वसुदेवसुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु Chapter three, verse number twenty-six. We have done it last time. Let's uh, chant it. Please uh, repeat after me. Chapter three, verse number twenty-six. Na buddhi bedam janayed, na buddhi bedam janayed. Agyanam karma sanginam, agyanam karma sanginam. Joshayet sarva karmani. जोषयेत जोषयेत्कर्माणी विद्वान्चर विद्वान्क्त सचर सो इट से दि वेदांत द एनलाइटन वन एंड ऑल्सो द सीकर दट डू नॉट कन्फ्यूज द इग्नोरेंट डोट गो एंड टेल दम यू आर ब्राह्मण एंड देर इज नो एक्शन फॉर यू यू आर नॉट द बॉडी एंड द माइंड encourage everybody in appropriate action in ethical and moral action encourage everybody by doing that action yourself uh but you remain centered in if you are a seeker in the knowledge that you have gained through vedanta with the help of your devotion and meditation if you if a person is enlightened remain centered in the true self in the atman as pure consciousness as the witness consciousness and that's how you work what's the context the context is action spirituality is all very well but what about this world what about our lives in this world that includes monks too see monks we are very clever what have you done you have given up the uh, world and uh, uh, what, what exactly does it mean you move from one house to another that one was the house and this is the ashram just change the name uh still eating give up lunch and dinner and now it's prasad this is the, the day of uh, but you cannot give up your existence in the world as long as one has an embodiment as a body and mind uh, one exists in some form or the other so what is the wise way of um living uh, some people may be very good on this philosophical side of it may be very devotional but they find life very turbulent and very difficult to cope with so that practical wisdom how to manifest one's spirituality in one's day to day life which wherever it is whether it's in the ashram or at home or in the office or in school wherever it is uh, one a christian pastor here in new york said that in every congregation you will find some people who are so heavenly they are very heavenly but no earthly good <laughs> <laughs> swami vivekananda gave talks on practical vedanta so one monk humorously in india a friend of mine he said do you know what practical vedanta means if you ask that monk to do something practical he'll give you a vedanta talk <laughs> that's practical vedanta no action is there for for those who are not at all interested in in religion or in materialistic engaged in the world of course there is action for those who are interested in religion who are spiritual seekers yes there is action your life is there you have to lead that life those if you he says to arjun if you consider yourself enlightened then too there is action the difference is um that the enlightened ones act for the welfare of others why should if i am enlightened why should i do anything in this world at all am i it isn't doesn't it mean freedom yes freedom at a spiritual level at the level of the body and mind when you are as long as you are part of the world you are engaged in the world so loka sangraha loka sangraha means welfare of the world welfare of others there was i sometimes mention the name of ram sukh das ji who was this uh, sadhu in uh, harid in swargashram near rishikesh um he was an expert on the gita expert is not quite the right term but he was immersed in the bhagavad gita um, so these little things he would tell for spiritual practice they are so useful very inspiring so in this verse when he's talking about it he says something very simple he says that a spiritual seeker 
should not do anything for oneself. Sadhak ko apne liye kuch nahi karna chahiye. That's, that's literally true, almost literally true if you're a monk. At the most you need to beg for your food maybe or even that comes to you. That's it. But if you're uh, 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 somebody in the world, apparently you're still doing something. But that's just the place, the office and the, the family and the situation you are placed in. You're taking care of that. But really, you're not invested in that. You know that your real, uh, that your real sustenance, your real goal is God. So... Nothing in the world is really done for myself. And yet you are doing things in the world. You are do, it, it becomes a service to humanity. Now, this is verse number 26. I had stopped there on purpose. I had stopped there on purpose. Uh, because the next two verses, 27 and 28, are uh, very important. In verses 27 and 28, Sri Krishna explains... As far as the world is concerned, as far as action is concerned, as far as our quotidian day-to-day -day life is con concerned, what is the difference between the ignorant and the enlightened? What is the difference between the person who has not realized the truth and the person who has realized Aham Brahmasmi? What's the difference? In these two verses, the essential teaching of Vedanta is there and its practical implication for our life. So it's connection to our day-to-day -day life. That is there in these two verses. What happens when I do not have this knowledge, when I'm not enlightened, and what happens when I have this knowledge, I'm a seeker, I'm trying to establish myself in this knowledge, or I am already enlightened. What's the difference that's, that's shown here? Um, before I go on, it says, Joshayet Sarva Karmani Vidwan Yukta Samacharan. The enlightened one should encourage everybody else in their uh, activities, doing so himself or herself, um, co continuously doing so, uh, co all activities, continuing all the activities oneself, the remaining, yukta means remaining centered, centered in, in the reality. I was just reading some beautiful reminiscences of Swami Preman uh, Premanandaji, who was a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, Babu Ram Maharaj. He was the first manager of Belurmat. Um, a wonderful uh, Swami, if you read his life story, it's so inspiring. I often say when you read the life stories of these great saints, uh, of these enlightened beings, that's actually the real commentary on these verses. That's the real expression of what does it mean when you see it in life, actually. How, how is it actually done? A simple thing. Enlightened being encouraging everyone to do whatever is necessary uh, by one's own personal example. So the reminiscence is very simple. Some, some monk who was a young monk at that time and who saw Swami Premananda, he said Swami Premananda would get up at 3.30 in the morning like all the other young monks and novices in the ashram in Belurmat, in the main, main monastery. Every day he, he would take particular care. The reminiscence is written like this. He would take particular care to make sure everybody was doing their meditation, japa and meditation properly, by doing so himself. He would come and sit with them. And then... Um, there would be uh, classes on scriptures, on texts, Vedanta texts. He would encourage everybody to study and discuss these things by doing so himself. He says he would come and, to come and attend all the classes. He would sit there and he would answer the questions of uh, the people who were there. But you see, this leading by example all the time. Does that Swami really need to study Vedanta texts anymore? No. Premanandaj is of a different category altogether. Uh, he is fully enlightened. He is Jivan Mukta. Does that Swami need to come to the uh, e evening prayers and morning meditation? That Swami's natural state of mind is meditation itself. But no, uh, it is for the sake of the, all the others, the youngsters who have come to become monks. So there he is encouraging them to do what monks should do. Um, to get up early in the morning, to meditate, devotional practices, service, um, study, all of that. Now let's go to verse number 27, 27 and 28. 27. Prakriti Kriyamarnani Prakriti Kriyamarnani Gune Karmani Sarvasha Gune Karmani Sarvasha Ahankara Vimudhatma 
अहंकार विमूढ़ात्मा कर्ताहमी मनते कर्ताहमी मनते ऑल वर्क ऑल एक्टिविटीज आर डन बाय प्रकृति आई एक्सप्लेन एवरीथिंग थ्रू इट्स गुणास वॉट इज प्रकृति वॉट आर गुणास वेट ऑल इन ड्यू टाइम थ्रू इट्स गुणास but deluded by the ahankara the ignorant one thinks that i am the doer all right this is the meaning of the verse remember what's happening krishna is explaining the earlier verse how does the unenlightened person the ignorant person act in the world and thereby gets trapped in samsara and how does the enlightened one work and um which is an instruction to us how should we live in this world so this is the teaching why these verses are important not only they contain the essence of vedantic teaching advaita vedanta teaching they contain the essence we'll see but they also give us the practical pointer how do we implement it in our day to day life um, how does it manifest in our life first of all before we go into the the secret the central teaching practically look at the lives of enlightened beings and the lives of ordinary people the difference in action becomes so obvious when you look at the lives of of course sri ramakrishna swami vivekananda the holy mother but also the direct disciples and all the um, great devotees and monks i have seen in my life till today and the life of the average person in samsara such a big difference in action um what they are doing when they're sitting in meditation i don't know is somebody dozing or is somebody in samadhi who knows but i know them i can see them in action the um the test is in in action when when you actually see them uh, in in samsara hmm. so many beautiful uh, examples i i have seen where <laughs> where does one start no action is too high or too low no activity no work Swami Vivekananda once in the early days of the monastery some of the direct disciples grumbled and complained about one of the brothers that he is studying too much vedanta and not doing the household chores i was suspicious it was swami abedananda but anyway it's it's that's not mentioned um but so then they complained to swami vivekananda that the pots and pans are not being washed uh and swami vivekananda said if one of your brothers wants to study uh uh-huh. and master vedanta let him do so you should be happy where are those pots and pans uh, uh, how many pots and pans do you have give them to me i'll wash them i'll clean them and he did he, he did it himself till the others were ashamed i don't know what effect it had on that monk but definitely the others so no work is too high or too small vivekananda himself i know this um in you know by small incidents you know it's when the small activities uh, this professor of philosophy in india he said when he was a kid a, a school boy he actually saw vivekananda um he was a professor of philosophy in muzaffarpur in, in what's in bihar now um he actually saw vivekananda he used to study in the school in a place called deoghar and um, swami vivekananda visited deoghar by that time he was already very well known and um, the the he said that our school teacher said the famous swami vivekananda is visiting we should all go and see him and so all the school kids they were taken out in their best uniforms and this boy who has written the reminiscence he said i had a new pair of shoes so i put them on and we went to see vivekananda and vivekananda was coming out of the place where he was staying and he was going to said i'm going to take a walk walk with me and so the school boys walked with him and uh, swami vivekananda pointed to my shoes and just pointed this way now my laces were not done properly so i didn't understand i just looked st- stupefied and and stared up at him and then the great swami vivekananda ne- went down on one knee and undid my laces and did them properly immediately and and got up and started walking and so he says that that day when i went back to the dorm I couldn't take off my shoes till late in the night because people kept trooping into my room to see the famous pair of shoes which had the shoelaces had been done but <laughs> tied by Vivekananda himself. This is such a tiny incident. 
work. No work is too high, too low. Um, I have seen monks, um, tremendous work from morning till night, yet relaxed and happy and serene. The reason is, as Ram Sukhdas Ji said, never do anything for yourself. Since they are not doing anything for themselves, they are not getting anything out of it personally. That gives them a tremendous sense of freedom. Swami Vivekananda said, do not work like a slave, work in freedom. One, one technique of, one, one of the features of working in freedom is, the, the one who does less than what is expected is a slave. The one who does what is expected is the honest person who is giving back to society what, what is expected. But the one who gives more than what is uh, expected, that one is working in freedom. Work in freedom. Sri Ramakrishna taught the Holy Mother. He said when he was suffering from cancer. He told her, when I'm gone, how should she live? And she said, it's one thing, she said, never put your hands out like this. Never ask. Always like this. That means you're always giving. That is the attitude of the enlightened person. You might think, what have we got to give? A smile, a little bit of good behavior, a few positive thoughts. Yeah. And, and to just, uh, just your, you know, they say that if you, the Franciscan order had this rule, that if you had a glum face, you're not allowed to go out into the world that day. <laughs> so, um, intense activity, activity for the sake of others, activity done in peace. Other, the people normally work in samsara for getting happiness. The enlightened being works out of happiness. Somebody told me that we struggle so much. And even in this country, it's, uh, uh, the re real struggle is you, you don't feel secure. Um, you have to keep on working and working so that you can accumulate more. Um, it's not so much greed as a sense of how much is enough. Not to satisfy one's greed, but at least just to feel secure. The enlightened person feels secure all the time. It works out of a sense of complete security. Not to become secure. Nothing in the world is there that you can add to yourself which will make you more secure. Nothing, really. So, practically when you look at the lives of spiritual seekers and in advanced spiritual seekers. Um, I mean, I could give so many examples. Okay, let me give a... I'm tempted to, so I'll spend a little time giving two or three examples. Small examples. Um, there's this uh, Swami I know. Later on, he became the president of the Ramakrishna order, Swami Gahanandaji. At that time, he was the general secretary of the order. One of the calmest persons I've seen. Uh, he was... Uh, um, uh, he was the head of one of our most troubled centers at that time when the communists were in power in uh, West Bengal. And one of our hospitals was always under siege by unions and strikes and so on and so forth. And this Swami was the head of that hospital. And there were times when he was surrounded by a slogan shouting... Uh, union members, uh, sometimes he was being shoved around physically, always calm. There's a, um, l a lawyer who did some law legal work for our ashrams there, and I met him once, he was very senior, very well-known lawyer of Bengal. Uh, he told me that, you know, how I became attracted to your order, to the Ramakrishna movement and all, that Swami, Gananandji. At that time, the Swami was head of that hospital and there were a lot of labor troubles going on there. The communists were trying to uh, take over the things. Um, I said, yes, I know. Well, at that time, there, were these group of, there was this group of uh, troublemakers uh, who were creating a lot of problem for the institution. Um, and the Swami decided to um, you know, fire them. You might think, that's, what's the big deal? It's a big deal. It's not a big deal here in the United States, but uh, it, it's a very difficult to fire. Well, at least it was at one time very difficult to fire somebody from a um, job in in that circumstance in those days. The laws were 
very, very difficult uh, to, you know. Uh, so no matter what the worker did, it would be very difficult to remove him from the job. Anyway, so the Swami had to prepare a case against the workers and the lawyer said, I would sit with the Swami and we'd late into the night working out the details. And, um, and there was political pressure coming in from political leaders threatening the Swami, don't, don't fire them. Uh, hold, let them stay in, the, uh, in their jobs. Because they had gone to their political masters, including a call the lawyer told me, including a call from the, the then chief minister of West Bengal, Jyoti Basu. Don't fire those workers. Politely. But politely, a call from the chief minister carries a huge amount of weight. <laughs> and the Swami quietly dealt with all of that. He would deal even with the people who were threatening, who were rough, who were polite, who were sophisticated, with the same gentleness he dealt with all. But firm. No question of shifting from that position. And they finally did it. And those workers were removed. All right. This, um, the lawyer said, months passed. A couple of months later, the Swami called me back. and said, you know, we have to do some work. What's the work? We have to take those people back. <laughs> but Swami, <laughs> we worked so hard to, you know, they're, they're troublemakers. And we worked so hard and you refused all those big people and all. And we worked so hard to get, get it done, and then now they're out. It's done. I said, yes, but you know, they have families. And they're suffering. Uh, children are there in their families, and uh, I can't bear it. We'll work out something. Let's get them back. And this lawyer said, that was the day you know, I was sold, <laughs> that this, is, this man is a saint. And from that day onwards, he has become a... So anyway, look at the heart and look at the engagement. He's, he's a monk to do hour after hour, day after day of boring legal work and finally get this thing done, which seems to have nothing to do with his spiritual monastic life. But he does it all as worship. And yet with what heart? His real concern is for the person, not for legal niceties and things like that, not for politics, or not even for how they have treated him. Not even for that. My personal interaction with him was a few times. Uh, one little incident, just the opposite. This is a big issue. Now let me give you a small issue. A very small, tiny incident, but which I was witness to. Uh, where he visited our ashram, where I was a brahmachari, just a newcomer. And uh, because the Swami is coming, he's a big Swami, uh, we had to make things right you know, like arrange the room and everything. And one of the young monks um, of my age, he was in charge of the maintenance and the water. So he decided to go all out and he got new fixtures and he p fixed the pipes. And, it. and so when the Swami came, this big Swami who's our revered guest, um, I think he at that time was the vice president of the order, uh, he comes in and he goes to take a shower and he's standing there in his towel and there's no water. Because he's done such a good job that there's no, no water coming anywhere. Earlier it was working at least. Now nothing works. <laughs> Very calmly. So by the time my friend r rushed in horror when he heard what was happening, he rushed and he's found the Swami sitting quietly with, his, with a towel around his waist and with a faint smile on his face. And the others were so upset and running around. He was not. And this might seem to be a very small thing, but uh, it shows. It reminds me of another Swami, Swami Lokeshwarananda, who was very famous for his absolutely even temper. Remember, these are not monks sitting in uh, meditation in, in mountains. They are in the midst of intense action. Imagine running a 500-bed hospital in the midst of uh, strikes and union action and all of that, and you are being uh, abused and uh, there's a... Indian word, I don't know if there is any English translation, or Gerard, <laughs> surrounded by agitating, shouting, hostile people, and still remaining calm. Um, the same thing with Swami Lokeshwarandaji. I've heard um, he is the head of this very big institute in, in Calcutta. It's known as the Institute of Culture in, uh, in Kolkata. And at, at that time, again, the same problem with the uh, unions and uh, communists and all. And somebody heard that there, there was going to be a procession of communists coming 
uh, who will you know, sort of break into the institute and you know create mayhem there. So one of the monks said to the Swami, uh, Swami Lokeshwaran, should I inform the police? We can get police protection. And the Swami said, no police. And one, the next day there was a protest outside the institute and there was a group, group of people shouting and they heard a big crash. And they rushed into the Swami's uh, uh, office where he was sitting and working. He was writing in those days, no email or anything, writing a letter. Somebody had thrown a rock through the window and the window was smashed and the rock was inside uh, on the carpet. The Swami was writing a letter. He looked up, saw the rock and went back to write. <laughs> he just said, no police. So deep calmness in the midst of intense action. Swami Bhuteshanandaji, who was the 12th president of the order, um, he used to go, he was the head of our ashram in Rajkot. He used to go to people's houses to collect money for the ashram. Now, see, for a deep and sincere spiritual seeker, it's actually a painful thing to go and ask for a little bit of money here and there and there. But you're doing it for uh, the Lord, for the, uh, for the work of the ashram, not for yourself <laughs> at all. He went to this very rich person's house who would give money to religious organizations. And he found these beggars waiting outside uh, for the handout. He stood in queue and the person inside was sitting and he asked, uh, the Swami from the Ramakrishna order was supposed to come and meet me today. Why isn't he here? And his people went out looking and they found him in the queue of beggars sitting in the queue there. And they rushed and pulled him inside and said, Swami, what are you doing there? I said, no, they have come to ask and I have come to ask too. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm waiting in, my, in line. Uh, these, I know these are not a very arranged presentation, but this gives you little ideas of the mentality behind the work being done by uh, an enlightened person or a, or a sincere spiritual seeker. There is no personal, no axe to grind there. It's working in complete freedom. All right. Now, this is on the surface. What's the secret behind it all? The secret is this. The I sense, who am I? That can mean two things. Here is the core of Vedanta and how do we apply it to our work, our day-to-day -day lives. The sense of I can, can mean two things. One is the sense which Sri Krishna calls ahankara. He uses the word ahankara vimuratma. The one deluded by ahankara. What is the Sanskrit word ahankara mean? It literally translates into ego. What do you mean by the ego? It means the sense of when you say I, normally the way we use I, I meaning this person, here, this body, this mind, this person, this narrative, this personal story. I am this. This use of I is called ahankara. That which identifies me with my body and with this body and mind. A little clarification here. When you say ego in English, or in Sanskrit, ahankara, the word ahankara in Sanskrit has the analogs in almost every Indian language. We immediately misunderstand. Why? Because there is another sense in the, uh, in the way the word ego is used or ahankara is used. Uh, in the sense of a proud person, arrogant person, um, you know, uh, someone who t has a superiority complex, who, what we call, uh, that person is very egotistical. But here it is not meant in that sense. Here it's meant in a philosophical or a psychological sense. Here it simply means the simple feeling of I, which we all get, right now we are getting it, and we can say things like, I am sitting here, I am speaking, or I am listening. There is no, no arrogance involved here. There is no pride or superiority complex involved here. It's just a psychological fact. I, there's a feeling of I. And that feeling is deeply associated with this person, not with anything else. This feeling of I, which is associated with one body and mind, to which all the others are other, not me. That is called ahankara. It is nothing to do with uh, e um, uh, egotism or pride or uh, uh, who's opposite you know the person you should not be egotistic one should be uh, humble that's a different thing altogether 
that's uh, th that depends on that's our about our mental attitudes but this is a simple psychological fact quite neutral in all our activities we have this sense of ahankara which reports what we are in this body and mind which and there is a technical definition in vedanta what is ahankara abhimanatmika antakarana vritti ahankara the function of the mind which is which has the the function of appropriating or identifying that which appropriates to itself all the activities of body and mind the body is walking i am walking here i'm seeing something i am seeing things memory is working i remember or i cannot remember um, intellect gets something i understand a desire arises i want you see the same i is appropriating to itself a cloud of activities going on around it that is called ahankara so that's one meaning of i and that's the meaning we are all used to and that's what uh, krishna is pointing out ahankara vimuhuratma the one deluded by ahankara what's the other meaning of i that is the atma or sakshi witness consciousness all our vedanta they don't look so puzzled you're not hearing it for the first time all our vedanta is to take us from the sense of ahankara to the witness consciousness so remember drigdrishya viveka the eyes are seeing the form the mind experiences the eyes i the consciousness experience the mind the mind is different from me the moment you separate the mind from the witness awareness so that that is the sakshi that's no longer ahankara you are even the witness of the i the i is a function happening in the mind and we are aware of it and that's nothing strange it's just that we we miss it all the time right now if we look into ourselves we will feel the i what is feeling the i there that is the witness consciousness and you can never objectify it the i can be objectified the feeling of ahankara can be objectified that's what enables shankaracharya to sing um mano buddhi ahankara chittani naham if you translate that i am not the mind i am not the intellect i am not the memory i am not the ego fair enough if you look closely you might say wait a minute what did you say i'm not the mind intellect um, memory fine i am not the ego it's literally saying i am not i what i is there and how can you truly said say i am not i what is then what is the difference between the two eyes not these two eyes <laughs> vertical what is the difference between the two eyes one is the pure witness the pure consciousness pure subject again be careful with these words i have seen people often misunderstand when i say pure consciousness many people think oh something like not thinking bad thoughts no 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 not like that pure consciousness is consciousness without any uh, objective constituent where i am that that which is aware of everything but of which you are not aware and that which lights up everything but it itself cannot be lit up that which is which objectifies everything but itself can never be objectified that is pure consciousness what you get by drig drishya viveka what you get by the method of the five sheets physical body here prana and the thought i can't show you the thoughts unless you are a telepath the thoughts in in the mind that is the mental body and the intellect which is understanding all this that's the vigyana maya kosha push beyond that you'll get a blankness that is the ananda maya kosha the five sheets physical sheet vital sheet mental sheet intellect sheet and the bliss sheet i'm not going to ex going to explain but what i'm saying is the witness consciousness the witness is the witness of all of these five sheets it's the ahankara where is the ahankara it's in the mind and the intellect it's in the intellect actually so the that is the ahankara and that's also a function of the mind or function of the intellect um that pure consciousness that's the meaning of the i which krishna is teaching which vedanta is teaching vedanta is saying you are actually that witness consciousness not the ahankara you are actually sakshi witness consciousness not ahankara what's the difference the sakshi the ahankara is subject to change ahankara is subject to change you see how it works is this let me give you the uh, sort of draw draw picture mentally sakshi is pure consciousness that's the real self 
think of it as a light. It's not a light, not a physical light. You won't start glowing. Again, I'm reminded of, because spiritual people do glow. <laughs> so I'm reminded of a little story I read about Swami Premananda again, because I was reading his reminiscences. So uh, the person who writes says that when he would come down after the worship of Sri Ramakrishna every day in Belurmat, it would be a sight to see. One day I was standing at the foot of the stairs in the temple, and he came down after the worship, and his face was, you know, sorry, he was very fair. So his face had become red, and it was literally glowing with an unearthly light. And I looked stunned at him. The person who's writing says, he says, I looked stunned at him and I said, you do not belong to this world. He looked at me and he smiled. And he said, neither do you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a glow, yes. But the pure consciousness is not that glow. <laughs> pure consciousness, just think of it as a light, uh, which lights up everything. Now, that light lights up the mind and this lit up mind is what we are experiencing as awareness right now let me repeat that the, the true uh, true atman the true self pure consciousness witness sakshi all of these words i'm using uh, indifferently that one lights up the mind right now and what we experience as the mind is mind plus that reflected consciousness Pure consciousness, real you. What you are experiencing now, each of us within ourselves right now, mind plus reflected consciousness. It's like real face, and I hold a mirror here. I will, what will I see? Not only a mirror, I will see my face in the mirror. What face is that? Not the real face. It's a reflected face. So I'm seeing two things, mirror plus reflected face. When we look into our minds, what you are experiencing there as a variety of thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, desires, continuously changing, but also awareness. All of those thoughts, feelings, memories are lit up by awareness. Oh, is this awareness, pure consciousness? Is this the Atman? Am I enlightened? No. That's the reflected consciousness. In Sanskrit, Sabhasa. Sabhasa means, Abhasa means shadow. Sabhasa means with shadow or with reflection. Mind with reflection. Sabhasa antakkarana vritti. That is the technical phrase. A modification of the mind with the reflection of consciousness. So that sounds awfully dry and technical. That's all that we know of life. Everything that you ever experience is a modification of the mind with the reflection of consciousness. Think about it. What you are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. No Swami, I am looking at you. So that's the, that's the experience we are having. Yes, but what, what's happening? Light is falling on my body and then it's going to the eyes. From your eyes through the nervous system it goes to the brain and somehow, operative word somehow, that is now becomes an image, a picture that you see in your mind. That picture which you are seeing in your mind, that's all that you are seeing. There's nothing else. You don't see the electrical activity in your brains, you don't see the nerves, you don't see actual light coming, nothing, none of that. All that we experience is what is there in our minds. And whatever is there in our minds is a modification of the mind with awareness. This is a, it's called antakkarana vritti and there the reflection of awareness is shining there. So this is what's going on. Um, and this is where, this, is, this, this thing is called ahankara. The ego functions at this level. It is the one which sees, hears, smells, tastes, touches, thinks, remembers. The technical name for this is the knower. Uh, ego with the mind becomes the knower. Sanskrit, pramata. So there is a distinction between pramata and sakshi. The knower and witness. This mind, the knower, together with the organs of action, now claims, I walk, I talk, I eat, I drive, and all of those actions. The, that knower now becomes the doer, the agent. Sanskrit, Karta. And doing action brings a result from the world. Uh, I have cooked, now I can eat. Becoming the eater. In Sanskrit, bhokta. Uh, eater just not physically just eating food. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, all the inputs from the world. When it affects us, when we, we begin to uh, in, enjoy or suffer, that is called bhokta. 
in english experiencer or enjoyer or sufferer or whatever so none of these are the real you the real you is the witness of all of these that witness consciousness reflected in the mind becomes knower pramata doer karta uh, enjoyer or sufferer bhokta pramata karta uh, pramata karta bhokta all of these are activities of ahankara of the ego so this is the distinction now what follows sakshi never changes ahankara is always associated with change moon reflected in water the moon itself may not be changing but when the water goes into waves you will see the reflection is changing similarly consciousness reflected in the mind the mind is always going through changes and you feel i the reflected consciousness that one that ahankara i am hungry now i am full i am ill now i am better i am in pain i am enjoying myself change 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 continuously and um this this doer and uh, uh, enjoyer or sufferer this is called samsari the one in samsara always trying to improve its situation yeah. never succeeding just a little more i'll be all right never guaranteed you'll never be all right and the sakshi it's never a samsari it's always perfectly all right it's always all right this is the distinction between witness consciousness sakshi which we are already and what vedanta says is understand this clearly and see it for yourself and see it for yourself because it's continuously available you don't have to become even the words witness is slightly misleading because we if we don't hear carefully we go away with the impression is that we are being told to be witnesses no you are already a witness if you practice being a witness that's still the ahankara see the even spiritual practice is done by the ahankara a little more enlightened kind of ahankara it becomes a spiritual seeker oh i will not be uh, engulfed by samsara anymore i must become a uh, seeker of god realization now earlier i was running around madly in the world and trying to be happy because with money and fame and pleasures now i'm trying to be happy by meditation and prayer and service still ahankara better better ahankara much better yeah. but not the sakshi yet the enlightened person knows that i am the sakshi for i for the enlightened person refers to sakshi for everybody else the materialistic worldly person and the ignorant as yet ignorant but still spiritual spiritual seeker but as yet ignorant even for that person i refers to ahankara so this is the difference what krishna is saying the enlightened the uh, enlightened person should act should do all activities knowing oneself to be the sakshi and yet work through the body and mind will the enlightened person still have ahankara will the enlightened person still have ego here is something to be understood carefully the answer is absolutely yes why not because sometimes the way the way the way we read spiritual texts and we hear things um, destroys the ego goes beyond the ego and uh, ego is the enemy kill the ego and then you are free true going killing the ego going beyond the ego it simply means transcending the ego simply means knowing i does not refer to the ego i refers to sakshi that's all it means the ego function of the mind will continue why not why not of course it will continue enlightened person has a body or not look at that clearly they have bodies if the body is functioning body is there so heart is functioning lungs are functioning kidney is functioning good brain is also functioning good that means the person has a mind enlightened person is a mindless or <laughs> Uh, they have brains but no minds no <laughs> even when i i have given a talk no mind <laughs> but there no mind means you're not identified with the mind the mind is an object an instrument i am not it that's what it means so mind is there if mind is there will memory will be there or the enlightened person means amnesiac no memory no memory will be there intellect will work memory will everything will work and a little better than everybody else <laughs> but the ego there 
is also seen as a clearly as a function of the mind as an, and not really me. Not really me. This is the difference between enlightened person and an ignorant person. That's all. And that's a very big difference. Those who have attended classes on Drik Drishya Viveka, you will know. A question is raised there. What is the relationship of the reflected consciousness? What is the relationship with the reflected consciousness with three things? One, with the body. Reflected consciousness and body. What is the relationship? Second, with the mind. And third, with the real self, pure consciousness. What is the relationship? Why, why, why is this question important? Because the last and the final thing that we can catch in our, our present experience is the reflected consciousness. You can do it right now. Notice, here is the body. And look within. Thoughts, feelings. Or, and aware of those thoughts and feelings. That awareness is the reflected consciousness. That's the last thing we can catch. Anybody. If you're just a little... Anybody can understand the body. Look inside. Anybody can understand the mind, more or less. And if you make a slight distinction between the fleeting thoughts and feelings and the sense of being aware, you're beginning to understand what the reflected consciousness is. That is called Chidabhasa or Abhasa, the shadow of consciousness. Stay there. Now, the question is being asked, what's the relationship of that consciousness with this body? What's the relationship of that, con that reflected consciousness with the mind, thoughts, feeling, your mind? And... What's its relationship with the real self which Vedanta is talking about? Because if you could understand that, then you can go from the reflected consciousness back to the real self. What is the relationship? The relationship with the body, it says, karma jam, it's bound to karma. As long as your karma is there, this body will live. Prarabdha karma is there, body will live and you will that re reflected consciousness will continue to identify with this body. When prarabdha karma of this body is exhausted, this body will die, which we call physical death. And then the reflected consciousness along with the mind travels to other bodies and there will be rebirth. And then you, that consciousness, will call a new body, this, I am this. No longer, that's, and that's not me. What they burnt or buried or whatever, that's not me. I am this new baby. <laughs> I am now with this. So the relationship between you the awareness and that body which you call your body is a relationship of karma as long as karma is there that reflect, reflected awareness will call it it's my body that's there you can't do anything about it it will change one day when the karma is gone a new body comes nothing to be done there second what's the relationship between the mind and that reflected consciousness if you, it's like asking what's the relationship between your reflected face and the mirror What's the relationship between the reflected moon and the water? What's the relationship? It says, Sahajam, natural. If there is a reflector, there will be a reflection. If there is a mirror, there will be a reflection. If there is water, you can see your face there or the sun will be reflected there. There is no way of separating the two. Reflected face and mirror, they are together. They stick together. You can't separate them. If you take away the uh, reflector, no reflection will be there. But as long as you are there and the reflector is there, there will be a reflected face. As long as the mind is functioning, consciousness is always lit up, there will be a reflected consciousness. Suppose you take the mirror away, no reflected face. Suppose the mind falls asleep, no reflected consciousness. That's why deep sleep seems to be the state of unconsciousness. It's not unconsciousness, no reflected consciousness. This consciousness which we are aware of right now, that disappears in deep sleep. It's there in waking, it's there in dream, but it disappears in deep sleep. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. uh, you're all eager, waiting for you. You're right, the third question is the most important one. That's the question which leads to enlightenment. Relationship between awareness and the mind is natural. As long as mind is functioning, you will feel awareness. When mind stops, that reflected awareness will disappear. Uh, but now the real question. This Atman, this witness consciousness, Sakshi you're talking about, what's its relationship with this reflected consciousness which I'm feeling? What's its relationship? And Rig Drishya Viveka says, Bhranti Janyam. No relationship. The only relationship is foolishness, stupidity. 
There is no really what is the real relationship between the face and the reflected face? Nothing. The reflected face is in the mirror. It has no physical connection directly with the, your original face. Whatever happens to the reflected face, nothing happens to your real face. Whatever happens to the reflection of the uh, of the sun in a little puddle, nothing happens to the real sun. There's really no physical connection between. I mean, physics will say light is there. It doesn't matter. That is different. This is different. It seems to be a connection because of ignorance. Bhranti means error. How do you remove this error? What is the error? What is, remember the, the nature of the error. I am this. This is my, my error. How do you remove this error? By knowledge. What knowledge? By knowledge of yourself as the witness. Once the reality is known, the reflection can continue to appear. You will not be confused anymore. Once I know my real face is this one, not the one I'm seeing in the mirror, then the mirror can be there, reflected face can be there, there can be concave mirror, there can be convex mirror, different kinds of faces will be there. I know it has nothing to do with me. My real face is here. Similarly, the witness consciousness, that little step from the <laughs> reflection back to you, it's not so difficult, really. It's not really so difficult. One teacher said the in, that, that intuition, that comes easily. That does, that is, does not come, uh, it is not too difficult. But stability takes time. Again, very careful. Stability in what? Stabilizing yourself as the witness. No. The witness, you as, as the witness, you are always stable. You always wear. When you have never heard of the such things also, you are always the witness without any problem at all. As Swami Premananda said, he said, you are not of this world and neither are you. You are spiritual beings right now as much as Swami Premananda. So why is he glowing? I am not glowing. It's just that we don't know it. And we think we are this mess called a body mind so that little step that takes time yes Maharaj, uh, are you talking about the first step of the yes, yes. And the second step would be everything everything else is uh, also nothing different from that witness consciousness see um, Sankhya is very strong in the Bhagavad Gita what is Sankhya it separates consciousness from nature from Prakriti What's the last thing in nature? What is nature? This world. We're coming to the verse now. This world, this body, even the mind. The last thing in nature is the ahankara, the eye sense. The most subtle thing. And there too, there are two things there. There is a function of the mind and the reflected consciousness. That's the, the finest, the tip, the, sp the spearhead of nature. That's the last thing. Beyond that is the transcendent, is, is, is divinity, God, Purusha, whatever you call it. You, the real you. Now, all of this, we are in a, in a position now to understand Krishna, what he is trying to say here. Prakriti kriyamanani gunei karmani sarvasha. The word prakriti, a very Sankhyan word, it means nature, material nature. Technically, prakriti is uh, in, in Sankhya and that has been borrowed by Vedanta, <coughs> is made of three things. What is prakriti after all? The seed state of nature from which entire universe has come. The cause, the causal state from which the entire universe has come. What's it made of? What's the seed made of? In Sankhya, the three gunas. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. And I will not go into the details. It's a big thing in, in uh, Sankhya and in Gita also. Three, three gunas. If the seed is made of the three gunas, the constituents, very briefly, Tamas is the force of Inertia and darkness, rajas of dynamism, activity, desire, sattva of stability, serenity, light. Um, these three are the constituents of prakriti and therefore all the products of prakriti. They are made of these three. So when he says prakriti and gunaha, guna here means the products of prakriti. What are the products of prakriti? The products of prakriti are um, stars and planets and uh, quarks and... Uh, uh, atoms and all of this and this chair and table and these buildings and our bodies and our senses and our minds. Mind is also material according to Vedanta. 
Sukshma, it's a subtle matter. Body is called stula, gross matter. But it's also matter. Why, is, why would you call it matter? What's the way to distinguish? Vedanta is a very elegant way of distinguishing consciousness and matter. Anything that you can experience is matter. I'll repeat that. Very elegant definition. Anything that you can experience is matter. So you experience this book. You can see it. You experience even your own eyes. You can touch it. You can open it and close it. You experience even a thought. That's also matter. Book is matter. Eyes are matter. Thought. I am seeing a book. That's also matter. Because you are experiencing it as an object. So all of this is matter. Up to this, even the finest of thoughts. Even the subtlest of thoughts is matter. Guna means matter. All the products of Prakriti. Prakriti is matter. The products of Prakriti is also material. And here when Krishna says, all work, all activity in our lives is done by the products of Prakriti. Prakriti gunehi. Karmani sarvasha kriyamanani. All activities are being done in our life. Everything that's going on in our lives is being done by the products of Prakriti. Which products of Prakriti is he interested in? Body-mind here. Specifically, the ahankara. The ego which connects you to the body-mind. So all of these are products of Prakriti, not you. Ahankara vimungudatma. The, the self here, deluded by ahankara. Ahankara means that which identifies you with this body-mind. Thinks, I am the doer. And therefore gets caught in samsara. Becomes pramata, knower, um, karta, doer, bhokta, enjoyer or sufferer. Samsari. And that's all that one knows oneself to be. Who knows this? It's, the, it's that same pure consciousness. Remember, even when the body and mind are acting, prakriti is acting. Um, you are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, doing action, enjoying and suffering. Pure consciousness, the witness consciousness is there. Without it, none of this would be possible. Consciousness is always there. When the light is shining, when the microphone is amplifying sound, electricity is there. When it was in the box, this gadget did not uh, amplify sound. When the bulb was in the box, it did not shine. Electricity is not the microphone, electricity is not the bulb, electricity is not even the function of the microphone, which is amplifying sound. Electricity is not even the function of the bulb, which is to shine and give light. But without electricity, none of this would be possible. None of this would be possible. Similarly, consciousness in itself is not a knower. Um, it's not something that sees, hears, smells, tastes or touches. But without that consciousness, there is no seeing, smelling, hearing, uh, nothing. So that, that shining, everything else shines. In the language of the Upanishad. Tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam. That shining, everything else shines. Tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. By its light. Its light, what are we talking about? I'm talking about you. By your light, you shining, everything else shines. By your light, everything here is lit up. Everything here means, first the mind is lit up. Then the senses are lit up. So then this body-mind complex, through that you light up the world. Light up the world means you experience the world. See, hear, smell, taste. Think about it, understand, love, hate, desire. All the activities of body and mind are like the bulb shining or the microphone amplifying sound. But they are made possible because of the presence of you, the witness consciousness. This lighting up. That's what the witness consciousness does. The point is, even when we think of ourselves as an ego connected with the body and mind, even then the witness consciousness is there. To think, even to make a mistake, I am in samsara, I am suffering, I have so many problems. Even to think that and feel that, that witness consciousness is necessary. Without that light, nothing else is possible. So you, that is always present. And that gives us hope. In whatever experience we have, Worldly experience, religious experience. Shankaracharya comments here, Karmani, work, all activities are performed by consciousness. He says, Laukikani uh, Shastriyani cha. All spiritual, all religious activities and worldly activities, all of them are performed because of the presence of that light through the ego. But not knowing oneself to be the witness consciousness, 
limiting oneself to being only the ego and identified with body and mind one becomes the doer karta aham iti manyate that witness consciousness itself not knowing it not knowing its own nature forgetting its own nature identifying only with the ego and through that with the body and mind thinks of itself as the doer and then is trapped yes so i have a question about the performing action huh. and the doing example yes Yes. So Certainly. But remember first of all make a little distance between you the person that you the person is that ahankara. I am a good person, I am a bad person, did I do the best? I did not do my best. All of that is ahankara. As witness consciousness, pure consciousness. You are you are separate from this. It's like looking at your a mirror with your face reflected in it. That is separate from you. then consider using the same uh, mind and intellect what was done and see what was i could do any better if it can can't be done better pray to the lord for the welfare of that person you need not worry so much about it an interesting story um swami turiyanand ji was in banaras and this this has been recorded by swami vasudevanand another monk who was very uh, very learned he has written this bhagavad gita uh, translated Shankara's commentary into Bengali with a lot of additional notes it's published by Udbodhan in Bengali um he was very very vedantic so uh, he wanted to uh, like a very good receptacle for the teachings of Turiyanand ji who was very non dualistic himself one day Turiyanand ji told Swami Vasudevananda always try to know yourself as the non doing the non doer the self which is not an not a doer not an ag- agent of action and then do work and then vasudevan ji said how is that possible uh, if you are doing work you always feel that i am doing this work so agentship is always there and turian ji says then take up some attitude particular attitude what does he mean attitude i am the servant of the lord i am the doer if i am a servant i'm still i still have the feeling of doing it but then you take up that attitude i am serving the lord so as a as the servant of the lord i am eager to do work as worship that way you can do it now swami vasudevananda spent some time seriously thinking about it how can one be the not doer and began to get an idea that i am the witness of all of this and body is working mind is working even the ego is also feeling that i am working but i am the awareness which is the witness of all of this and you will say yeah some of you are nodding yes, that's what you are taught that's what was being taught right <laughs> yes but here is the problem one day he was using a pestle to grind spices in the kitchen and i'm sure he was thinking about vedanta it's not a good idea when you're hammering something with a pestle and <laughs> thinking about vedanta and he hit his thumb and he shouted oof and immediately he ran to swami turiyananda swami see the travail the, the the problem the samskaras of the mind i have understood what you said and i agree with you that i am the non doing awareness but when the pestle hit my thumb i shouted oof i feel i have hit myself i am suffering i am the one who hit myself i am the one who is in pain and i am the one who shouted oof the swami said ah but it's the mind which shouted oof and you are the witness of that mind too it is the mind which is the doer you are not the doer he says let it be so let let that oof come also that will take time to <laughs> but even if if this it is an important point to reach that level of detachment and serenity where we are not affected by physical pain or serious troubles in my life it takes a lot of time but even before that if one has the attitude one one begins to see in me the field of awareness this sharp pain came and automatically the mind reacted by saying oof it hurt the mind reacted and all of this is being lit up by me the unchanging awareness if this much understanding is there that's also very good 
what will happen is it will help your recovery immediately the the sorrow and the misery and the reactions from what the world is throwing at you those will be much less already at our level do you see what i'm trying to say just that much understanding that also can help help a lot but be careful huh? <laughs> yeah the this is a small ouch there can be very big problems in life where one may feel overwhelmed but again after your that big wave has passed when you use this understanding the beauty of this understanding is it's a direct reporting of the truth is this is a fact once you see this she noticed that yes the one which did the action and one which suffered that action and the suffering the doing and the suffering that came and that went that was not there earlier was there for a, in an instant and is gone now and there is a memory also but i was aware of its absence in the beginning i was aware of its presence that flash of pain i'm aware of the memory of that pain i'm aware of the reaction and the fading away of the reaction that awareness is constant and that i am i am not affected by the ups and downs of the agent of the ahankara body ages the ahankara says i am growing old body gets wrinkles i am wrinkled <laughs> body gets then the, uh, the mind gets depression i am so sad and mind gets elated at something nice happening i'm wonderful i'm excited our swami in houston is humorous you know he says atmarupanji he says if you look at the advertisements some new cereal has come out and we look at the people who are eating the cereal wow i'm so excited wonderful this is fantastic and he says no 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 there's no food in the world which can honestly give you that reaction <laughs> nothing really <laughs> gives you no food no cereal can actually make you so excited that would be a very strange person who gets so excited over a cereal ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, so i am unaffected by these ups and downs so he says ahankara vimuratma kartaham iti manyate the one who is deluded by ahankara and thinks it of himself as the doer and gets caught in samsara the witness is not caught and when we know ourselves as the witness to that extent itself our recovery from suffering is much faster recovery means internal recovery body will continue sickness will come and go and one day the body itself will go one person see ashtavakra says that um you know what the attitude of a person who has understood that i am the witness consciousness the attitude should be this is an advice to somebody who is actually critically ill ashtavakra's advice should be would be let death come today honestly let it come today or let me recover from the illness and live for up to 100 years i am perfectly all right with both it would be wonderful if you could do that you can do it and it's in fact a fact the witness consciousness the sakshi is perfectly all right with both it really has nothing to do with the body dying out out of illness now or even with the body recovering from the illness and living for 40 more years witness consciousness is neither increased by living for 40 more in years uh, it not diminished by dying today the consciousness does not die nor does the consciousness live on with the body this thing because we are un- unaware of ourselves as this immortal being isness sat means isness it is no birth no death because we are unaware of that nature the sat nature the pure being nature of ourself we have what is called clinging to life we want to live in this body when sadhu put it in very brief in hindi it um, अपना सत स्वरूप को न जानना उसका नाम है जिजी विषा जिजी विषा मीन्स डिजायर टू लिव एज अ बॉडी अपना चित स्वरूप का न जानना नॉट नोइंग योर सेल्फ एज अवेयरनेस इट लीड्स टू जिज्ञासा द डिजायर टू नो थिंग्स इन द वर्ल्ड पीस मिल लिटिल बाई लिटिल बाई लिटिल मोर एंड मोर दिस नो इन टू नोइंग एंड बाय द टाइम यू हैव कंप्लीटेड यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ गॉट इन वॉट यू लर्न इन स्कूल and by the time you have 
finished all your learning and read all, all these books and uh, papers and everything, then old age comes. Yeah. Memory starts d dropping out. You begin to forget what you've accumulated after 40 years of learning in life. For a person whose whole life is in that, it's tragedy. It's like a multimillionaire who loses everything in a Wall, in a Wall Street stock market crash. Whatever I worked for in my life, my joy, my wealth, gone. Oh, how terrible. Whatever I worked for in my life, all these things I learned, I memorized, I studied, I understood. One great philosopher once told me, he had a stroke. He said, Swami, I'm so depressed. A great philosopher. Indian philosophy, Vedanta, Nyaya, Western philosophy, phenomenology and so on. He said, Swami, I, I have, I'm feeling depressed. Why? I can't remember. And I'm, I can't catch it. I, I'm not as quick as I used to be. So You don't need a stroke for that. Old age will do that to you. If my investment is in that, that is my identity. Terrible then. I'm losing that. But if you know yourself as this witness consciousness, you are the witness of the keen memory, the witness of the failing memory. The witness of um, extraordinary good health, the witness of failing uh, health in the body. Absolutely, that witness is not affected at all. Not even the least. That distinction, if it becomes clear, Rigdrisha Vivek says, Antar Drigdrisha Yor Bhedaha. Inside yourself. Inside yourself means not physical inside. If you physically look inside the body, you'll find more body. <laughs> Flesh and blood and bones. Inside yourself means in your own experience. Your experience, what we are having now, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. If you examine that experience, the distinction between what is experienced and the illumining consciousness, that distinction, the little gap, that is very valuable. That's what Krishna is pointing towards. Yes. So, this is the unenlightened person getting deluded by ahankara gets caught in samsara. Then what does the enlightened person do? Next time. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu